Welcome to the Ogden Potter's House podcast. Today we have a very, very special episode and I'm very excited to even be releasing it. I was excited the moment we hit record and the moment we stopped. Um, Because a few weeks ago I got to have a very phenomenal conversation and uh, just a great time overall uh, with the Indian uh, fellowship leader, Pastor Paki Raj. He's the fellowship leader of the Indian wing of our fellowship coming from Bangalore, India. And in this episode, we talk about very, very great things. I don't want to give away too much, but if you're a pastor, if you're a disciple, prepare to be stirred, prepare to be encouraged. So open your hearts and enjoy Pastor Paki Raj's testimony. Pastor Raj, I just want to thank you for uh, coming out, helping us out, and sacrificing a little bit of your Sunday to be a part of this uh, blessing. Uh, we've had a tremendous couple of services. It's an honor to have you here today. Appreciate you guys. Yeah, thank you, man. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, just so far, how are you enjoying Ogden and the congregation? Fantastic. You know, I've just been uh, super blessed. And uh, to see all that God is doing, I'm really charged up and, you know, really stirred to see what God is doing here in Ogden. Amen, amen. So the whole concept of this podcast, uh, um, or really, I take inspiration from Prescott and um, just other fellowship podcasts around the world. But the main thing that I do with this, uh, well, that we do with this is to get the full, full story, um, you know, because we hear snippets of testimonies mm-hmm. and the preaching or, you know, at concerts when people give their testimony. Um, mm. So the first question that I have for you, um, so before all the conferences, before the rallies, before all the men's discipleships and revivals, what was your life like prior to salvation? <clears throat> prior to salvation, I was born in a Christian family, you know, um, church was not new to us uh, obviously my dad comes from a Lutheran background and uh, my mom's side is coming from a Protestant background so all the while we knew um, you know going to church and my grandfather which is from my fa- mother's side he was the organist he played the pipe organ in church so we used to go to church and you know and Sunday morning to church and so um, Christianity was not new to us but then it was just namesake Christianity it was just you know just go to church and you know, fulfill uh, you know that obligation of being there on a Sunday so that's pretty much how my upbringing was you know what and uh, I did things just because I need to follow my parents and so as a young boy I remember just going to church just because I need to go and there was no real purpose in going to church or you know having a desire for what God would do and things like that so so with the two you know religious backgrounds from your father and then your mom mm. was there ever like conflict growing up like just in your own mind like you know was there confusion like what what's real what's I wouldn't say there was any confusion but um it was just monotonous is what I would say. I didn't really give any attention towards spirituality or things like that. I did things because my parents told us to do so. So we just followed things and it was just monotonous. You knew that if it's Sunday would come in, you know, you got to be in church. And once you're done with church, you have lunch and boom, done. That's all, you know. So nothing to do with spirituality or, uh, you know, things like that. It was just something that we did it because we had to do it. Yeah, it was it was all like a religiousness, and yeah, just ritualistic. A, absolutely, yeah. So when did it actually, you know, you come to a point where you were seeking that out, you know, righteousness and getting saved? When did that, you know, just kind of take me through like a timeline? <clears throat> well, um, my mom always was very spiritual. She always, you know, had some things that uh, she always used to speak to me and he was always used to tell me God's hand is on you son and she used to always speak those words over my life but I never gave any attention to that you know I even though uh, she used to say those words but I just wanted to do what I wanted to do yeah. uh, but uh, I think when I really started to think about it was when I was probably um, you know past, well past my teenagers here, teenage years is when I really started to think about God and all of those things really made a lot of sense to me. Again, only because my mom took, 
the initiative to keep telling us. So mm -hmm. that's when. So after teenage years is probably when I was past past fourteen, fifteen is when I started to think about Christ. So that's when you know you you did you like fully like commit or was it just kind of like curiosity like just well i never committed it to anything so yeah. it was just out of it's just curiosity and just just listening to mom and you know just being respectful and honorable to what she's trying to say and not being mean yeah. and show an attitude to her so i was just kind of wanting to please mom uh and just listen to her and kind of just go on with what she says um but um it all changed a few years later when i had an encounter with god myself do you remember like specifically how that all went down? Yeah, because my, well, my mom, she broke away from the established church. She had an encounter with Christ first uh, at home. She, she was praying. I believe she was reading the book of Acts. And then as she read about the Holy Ghost and all of the dynamics, so she had an encounter with God. She got filled with the Holy Spirit. and But the church we went to did not believe in the Holy Spirit. There was no speaking of t in tongues or anything. So when she questioned the pastor there, and the pastor threw her out of church. Yeah. So... Um, she she had to come out of church and she found an apostolic church where they believed in the Holy Spirit. They spoke in tongues and they were pretty evident about it. And conflict ensued because uh, my mom used to go to the apostolic church. My dad and I and my brother used to go to the established church. Mm -hmm. Then eventually one day I followed my mom to her church, you know, and uh, that's where I had an encounter with God. In one of the sermons, um, you know, I really felt God speak to me and um, I responded to an altar call in an apostolic church and I got filled with the Holy Spirit powerfully. This was at the age of 19. Mm. But unfortunately, you know what, um, I got dragged out, uh, backslid after that. Yeah. Because, you know, you in the teenage years and all of those things, I didn't have anything solid to keep me in church. So I just kind of slipped through the cracks. How many years did you spend in that backslid? A couple stage? of years, a couple of years. Um, because also what was uh, a contributing factor was the church, the apostolic church that we used to go to, the pastor fell immoral. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, every part of me and my beliefs and convictions were shattered because now the person that I looked up to had fallen morally. And in my, my mind, I'm thinking, uh, this all must be a hoax, you know, this guy and, you know, this church and this, because, you know, how could he do it? And and yeah. then he justified his sins saying that the Holy Spirit spoke to him about it. Oh, that wow. he told, to, you know, that God told, uh, the Holy Spirit told him, you need to help this woman out, even though she was not his wife. So then that caused me to go spin around and go to different churches and hop churches and, you know, just leave the faith, you know, leave kind of the convictions. And I forgot about all of those things. Yeah, I remember you said that you and your wife were kind of like church hopping. What was that like? Was yeah, that so, um, so I met my wife in the apostolic church. That's where I met her first. Mm -hmm. So uh, we were just good friends. You know, we were a group of young people all coming to church. And truly, God was really moving in that apostolic church. I remember very vividly, we used to have uh, street preaching, dawn preaching. Early morning, we used to go up. At five in the morning, we would stand in the street corners and preach. Dang. So you're talking about young people doing that. You so I saw that God was doing something. This was not new. Uh, I said rather this was new for you know the people around there. So then, when this thing happened, you know my wife and I, you know we were at that time we were kind of you know liking each other. You know I had you know I had expressed my desire, you know to uh, you know get married to her and things like that. So we were still not married. But when all of this came, you know, she also left the church when I left the church. So we were, you know, because of the sheer, uh, you know, relationship factor, we started going out to church, to different churches. We started doing church shopping, just church hopping, go here and there. That's what, you know, see, where do we fit in? And so how did you, did you guys eventually stumble upon the potter's house or the door? Yeah, so... Um, this this went on for a few years, you know, um, just jumping and he looking around and things like that. And um, I remember uh, my wife's brother, he used to uh, go to the Door Christian Church, we have called the Door in do you Bangalore. Remember, sorry, who, do you remember who the, the pastor was? Pastor Oscar Gafur. Mm -hmm out of Chandler I had he was the one who pioneered India he got sent out in the year 2000 the church opened out in 2001 oh. so um, it's called the door and uh, he was a Muslim convert 
So he was an ex-Muslim, you know, so obviously that created a lot of stir in Bangalore when a man from the Islamic background is preaching about Christ. So a lot of people begin to check him out and things like that. So out of that, my brother-in-law also received an invite to go see. So he used to just visit once in a while and things like that. But then, you know, um, I was good friends with uh, my wife's brother, you know, because, you know, we knew each other from childhood and things. So, but then one day he just told, you know, there's a church here. Why don't you check it out and things? So that's when I got an invitation. I asked my wife to come. At that time, she was my girlfriend. She didn't come. I went in and uh, the first service, I very uh, remember very vividly, June 22nd, 2002, uh, that sermon really touched my heart. He was, the pastor was preaching and... Um, straight to your heart. I remember him saying, how long will you keep running from Christ? There's somebody here, you're running from God. I knew it was me. Yeah. And I surrendered my life to Christ that day. Amen. And uh, your wife followed suit? Yeah, so I was super excited to, you know, that's the, that's the first time after quite some time I felt the touch of God. You know that when the, when the Holy Spirit is in a certain place, and in that God was there in that place. And everything that the pastor was preaching, is, I felt like somebody was snitching on me. Because the pastor was telling things, I'm like, dude, somebody knows about me. You know, he's been telling. And the, in the sermons and things, even just in the first sermon, he was talking about things that I personally was going through. So I, I came back super excited. I told my wife at that time, I told um, Sam, uh, my wife's name is Samantha. So I said, Sam, you need to come check this place out. She yeah. did not want to come because she was done with this whole you know church stuff and everything because we were so bitter with what the experience that happened and um, I said let's just come and check it out next service she came she got gloriously saved I didn't have to force her I didn't have to do anything I never uh, you know forced her into any, any, anything but she experienced what I experienced the first service there yeah and she said man we, we, we are home we found it and uh, Within the next uh, few weeks, you know what we were we were serving God there. And when did you guys get married? So this was in two thousand and uh, uh, two thousand and two. We came in and uh, we started being faithful to church. One year into my um, into my salvation, my pastor had to leave and he had to come back to the U.S. You know, so mm -hmm. there was a transition. And uh, Dan and Monica Rubianis out of Chandler, they came to go over the work in two thousand and three. And um, and he started helping and discipling us and uh, started helping us as a couple, really, to put things in place. So 2005 is when we got married. That's, that's good. So, Pastor, you were under Pastor Oscar for what, like about a year? Just about a year. About a year. And then um, how many pastoral changes were you under like while you were attending that church? Well, as of date, you know, I've had three pastors. Okay. Pastor Gafoor was the one first, and then Dan and Monica Rubianis was number two. Then uh, Chuck and Raylene Baker was another pastor that I had. And then now Pastor Campbell is my pastor. Amen. So my next question that I have for you, um, um, just what were some key impartations that were passed down to you um, through your discipleship, you know, throughout all the pastors that you've been under? Do you remember any specific ones? Well, quite a number of influence that I've had, and obviously discipleship is impartation, and uh, every one of these men have imparted something s spiritual in me. Pastor Gafur, for sure, I remember very vividly uh, his zeal for the things of God, his passion, his excitement, and uh, he was just a radical convert, so to be radical is something that I learned really from him. I remember him, he would go stand in front of the mosque in Bangalore and as the people would finish their prayer and come out of the mosque he would be street preaching towards them being an ex-Muslim himself and then all these Islamic people would start coming after him chasing him to you know uh, to uh, beat him up but he would just take off from there <laughs> so I've seen those type of crazy stuff and just his radical preaching so uh, the impartation of being radical uh, really helped me I'm I'm glad you know I did not get mellowed down you know so that was something that I remember very vividly Dan and Monica Rubian is for sure he had a major chunk uh, of influence in my life you know obviously um, Pastor Campbell's my pastor now for almost uh, 10 plus years now but Dan and Monica Rubian is being missionaries in Bangalore they he discipled me for eight years 
So a lot of the things that I learned in my early ministry was because of direct uh, impartation of Dan and Monica. So I remember learning quite a number of things from him and uh, in a character, you know, how character is so critical. And um, he always taught me to, uh, you know, give attention to detail, you know, made me understand the small things in life really matter the most. And, and you know, um, quite a number of things that I learned from him, his um, sacrifice. I remember hearing his testimony about how he was in line to become, uh, uh, you know, an, a statewide head of a company, but then, you know, he chose to drop it just so that he could be a missionary. Wow. Down the line, me, myself, and I had an opportunity to come to America. You know, those kind of decisions really stirred me to make my own choices and my own sacrifices. So, and obviously, Pastor Campbell, you know, this, I've learned so many things about him. And one of the things some people have recently told me, my own wife and then many others have told me, Pastor, you're gracious. You're, the way you deal is so gracious. And I attribute that to being a disciple of Pastor Campbell. Pastor Campbell is a very gracious man. He helps people and he redeems people out, you know, and then he just doesn't see people at their face value now. He works with them for who they can be. Yeah. So those are some of the <clears throat> dynamics I learned from my pastor now. That's one thing I love about our fellowship is you see somebody preaching and they say, oh, this this person's my pastor, you know, Pastor Campbell or Pastor Martinez. I noticed that at our Bible conference, you know, just the impartation of everything from character adjustments to uh, preaching style. It's, it's so evident. That's one thing I really, really love about our uh, fellowship. But speaking of like impartation and influence, um, you know, so you're you're a disciple. What would you say um, at that time in your life? What influenced you as a young convert to really be separated? You know, from more than a disciple. You know, like I want to preach. When did what influenced you? Well, it is definitely the preaching. You know, the preaching and the vision. Vision is very key. I remember, you know, Pastor, uh, you know, preaching on vision. Uh, he was always casting the mantle of the vision yeah. of what God wants. And, you know, hearing those really stirred us. And then one of the most important thing that I would, I believe that was a catalyst for my, uh, you know, um, calling was the world evangelism videos. I remember uh, seeing these videos when Pastor used to put those Chandler videos. I remember seeing Prescott Chandler video, uh, conference videos and, and to see what we were doing in Bangalore and to see the things that were happening all around the world gave me such a great joy that we are not just one some obscure group doing something small but it showed us that you know we were part of a larger vision and yeah. that really stirred my heart and then obviously the preaching of the word of god and you know the challenge towards calling and allowing god's will to be fulfilled in your life these are all catalysts and that which really helped me personally to uh, you know make that decision so obviously i never had preaching or anything like that in my mind you know i had no clue about calling or anything but it was in the first conference when i really heard that got stirred and i remember when uh, pastor joe zebel pulled a, a, a call and he said is there anybody here men you are called to preach and you feel the stirring of the holy ghost that's the first time i really felt that in 2004 that's when I raised my hand. I came forward. I said, I want to be a preacher of the Word of God. Amen. And so, just going through the timeline, you know, you and your wife were married. When did you eventually first get launched out? What year? Do you remember? We got married in 2005, and I was out 2007. Amen. Two yeah, years. Yeah, just quick. It was a quick... Uh, by then, you know, we were, <clears throat> I was already, you know, doing quite a number of things. And then, you know, I was the door director immediately. And, you know, my pastor helped me. 2007, you know, I was out of the door. And uh, where did you guys first get launched out to? Yeah, it's a, it's a small little suburb right there by our mother church. It's probably a 15, 20 minutes drive from there. And that's where we started, you uh, know, our church very close by. Do you remember, like, those first initial, like, thoughts that came to your mind like leaving the mother church now it's just you and your wife yeah i remember the f 
is were pretty weird you know when you've been in church all all these years and then you're just by your wife and incidentally the first time uh, i remember it was a wednesday mm-hmm. and uh, we're out and it's the first wednesday <coughs> so uh, s- sunday night obviously you know sunday m- night uh, i preached my farewell was on a sunday night so you know they they prayed for us and we had a fellowship and everything but that wednesday you know i'm not in church but that wednesday i'm so i chose to be on outreach uh, in the place that i was going to uh, be pioneering and i remember landing in that place on a wednesday and i feel odd yeah cuz all these wednesdays you're in church and now you know you're not in church you know so what do you do so i was i was um, you know on outreach in that place so i remember i felt like a fish out of water <laughs> yeah that's a good way to put it and then um you know fast forwarding till now um there's there's been so many like elevations in your ministry and um what were like character adjustments or things like how did you handle you know going from you know a disciple to a pastor you know just little elevations in responsibility ministry um what were some things decisions that you made well one of the things i remember very vividly is uh my pastor used to always tell me that you know what you have to be faithful to whatever god puts your way puts in your way don't ever mistreat it don't ever just you know take it lightly and the bible is so clear for whoever god calls he equips them and i believe that you know wherever god takes you you know he always sustains you and ex- equips you through that and your character kind of builds according to that so uh, that's the kind of thing i started making a character adjustment is that lord whatever you want me to do i'm ready to do it as long as you're going to sustain me i'm not going to be doing this by my own strength so i was always willing anything anything whatever you want me to do so that's when pioneering became easy taking over became easy uh being as an assistant was easy uh easy in the sense the decision was easy it was, yeah. it was never hard for me i never contemplated and ever said i'm going to fast for 3 days and see how it goes and stuff like that i already settled in my heart yeah so a lot of the listeners that listen to this podcast some of them are pioneer pastors currently mm-hmm. pioneering their first work mm. or it's very new the whole concept um what's some encouragement that you could pass on to them you know uh just first time pioneers well you do um, even before you get to pioneering i would always encourage people who are thinking of being used by god to do everything you can in the mother church because many things that you do not settle in your heart in the mother church is very hard for you to do on the field mm. so um it's always something that you can achieve that under the protection and the guidance of your mother church and it's always good to be that blessing in another man's ministry when we are faithful with another man's ministry god gives us our own so you know being a blessing to your mother church your pastor in all of those things i would encourage pioneers to understand that and then when you get on the field it's very easy you don't really reinvent the wheel you just do what you learned in the mother church and just keep that same just keep that uh, you know the circle going the cycle going and um, i would encourage every pioneer listener if you're there you know you li- you're listening to this you know what um don't take it easy you have to push you got to put the you know you got to step up the you know the uh, accelerator and just go all out for god when you're pioneering and get the mind of god for wherever you are and that's what i did i everything i did i ran it across ac- according to what i experienced in the mother church what would my pastor do how did he handle these situations i watched him very carefully when i was in the mother church i watched his decisions his routines the way he handled things and then in the what the things he imparted in me and it was so easy i just i just replicated that mm. in wherever i was and you know and what we do works we really don't need Amen. to change anything new yes, sir so now fast forwarding to the future or present um now you're in bangalore um can you give us a little bit of a update on what's going on there maybe a little quick report yeah so um right now you know um we started off as the only church in india in bangalore the church that i pastor right now is the first church but now we have 45 churches in india and uh, a 
good number of them are in Bangalore because it's a very cosmopolitan place and things like that. We probably have 16 churches in Bangalore out of the 45 and the rest of the ones are all spread across different states right now. So a majority of our pastors are local Indian pastors, local pastors. We do have a few missionaries in few states right now. But uh, God's really helping, God's really moving among uh, the young people in our in our nation because stats say that uh, a vast majority of the young people in in, in the in the uh, population are younger people so um, we're able to really reach a lot of young people for Christ that's awesome so I've heard just from our friends who mission, uh, were missionaries in India my mm-hmm. you know, brother Omar uh, pastor Archie they've shared with us that the witnessing over there is very different. Mm-hmm. Um, like it's very, they have to be very tactful about how they go about mm-hmm. um, witnessing versus America. Can you kind of go into that? Is it the same for you guys? Yeah, it's still the same because uh, every nation has its uh, stronghold. Mm. Every nation has its uh, difficulties and setbacks. Um, and uh, India being a, a populist nation and also a nation filled with idolatry and false religion. So uh, bringing the gospel there is not as easy as many times what people think. 2010, I remember my first time coming to uh, the U.S. Uh, one of the one of the um, uh, standout uh, thing that I saw is the liberty and the freedom of preaching the gospel in your nation. And sometimes you can take it for granted. Because yeah. when I came and I said, oh my God, I wish I had this liberty back home. Because yeah. of the suppression and you know the, uh, the volatileness of the situation. So you always have to think twice before you outreach and who you speak to and things like that because it, you, it can get you into a lot of trouble. That's crazy. Have you guys ever experienced that? Quite a number of times we've had uh, radical Trouble. groups assault us. We've got a number of our disciples beaten up. I remember one particular instance, uh, you know, we had a mob of 45, 50 men barge into our church and just start breaking things around and they're starting to abuse us physically and, you know, pull us to the police station and things like that. God really moved. There's constant threatening on the streets, you know, people who threaten you to uh, you know to uh, abuse you uh, uh, people following you and cussing you out and um, and these are serious threats you know because um, idolatry and false religion is very is a very aggressive spirit mm-hmm. and it's always kind of very aggressive and want to intimidate you but this is part and parcel of life yeah so just over the past couple of days getting to know you through the preaching and just hanging out with you 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 kind of shared a little bit of the radical conversions that have happened in your church Mm -hmm. Um, are there any ones that come to mind that you'd be willing to share just highlights of um, miracles or conversions yeah like I said you know definitely one of those uh, couples I was talking about you know he's a young man was going to commit suicide coming from a Hindu background and got witness to and he got saved and his entire family started coming to church he's one of those and then the other couple that I shared who had no kids you know, they came in and, you know, um, and God moved supernaturally today. Today they, are, today they have wonderful, ki- uh, you know, children. And like that, we have a number of uh, good, conver- you know, conversions, uh, transformations that God has done. Um, I remember uh, brothers, you know, came to church. One of the older brother got saved. He came to church. So his mom sent uh, his younger brother to pull him out of church. So the younger brother came to church to pull out his older brother and uh, the younger one ended up getting saved. So both of them got saved, you know, um, powerfully. And then we have people like that who've come from radical drug addictions. We've seen people who come from suicidal thoughts. Uh, we've, co- we've seen people who come from uh, broken homes and families like that. So many, many good conversions and uh, you know, good uh, uh, testimonies of people get saved. Yeah. So you've preached all around the world and you've seen a lot. Um, what are some of the highlights or notable things that you've seen over the years that just, just come to mind off the top of your head? Just best things that you've seen throughout the years? Um, in terms of um, 
things that I have seen personally. Yeah. Yeah, preaching all around the world, obviously, you know, uh, such a blessing. Uh, I had no clue that I would travel around the world mm -hmm. and uh, what God had for me. But to see different cultures and to see what God is doing in different nations really stirs me. Uh, but most importantly, you know, it just humbles me that, uh, you know what, uh, um, God's not done with my life personally. So and I don't speak from an angle this morning, this evening, uh, rather than now that... Uh, I've come to a place. I don't ever consider that I've arrived. I believe God has greater things for me. And every time I go to different places and I see these things, I only get stirred in my own heart to see what God would still do through me and uh, through people's lives being changed or how the gospel is going. And and then there are definitely sometimes, you know, some sometimes where God really reassures me and says, see, um, you know, I, this is what I'm doing in this place. I can do it in your life, too. So I really get stirred. And that's the same thing with Ogden. You know, this week, um, you know, I've been able to minister, but I believe I have been ministered to also personally yeah. and I take back those uh, you know impartations with me and and I love that to you know kind of stir me to greater things for God Amen. Um, so one of the last questions I got for you um, is uh, what's something that you try to instill to your disciples back home that you would like to share with disciples all around the world that are probably listening right now well, if there's one thing that I will tell the, any disciple is go all in. There is nothing called as going half-hearted. And going all in really matters a lot. And because that's the only way that you can do you can do anything for God that really is going to be noteworthy or eternity, uh, you know, um, um, eternity factor. Because... Um, Today there's so many distractions, there's probably so many things that people are caught up with, things in their mind. I would challenge every young disciple to just go all in with God. All in means in every area. So if you if you're reading your if you're reading your Bible, go all in. Not just shallow reading, go deeper. You're praying, go all in. It's not just a token prayer, but you have an you have a dialogue with God. You begin to get into it. You giving, go all in. You know, sacrifice, give above and beyond. You're worshiping, go all in. You're outreaching, go all in. Every area, if we just have that all in mentality, go all in for God. It's 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 amazing. And just like uh, you know the prophet Ezekiel, I believe uh, the um, story about the vision going in and as he's going through ankle deep waters so many people are satisfied with ankle deep waters when God says ankle deep is not enough that you go to knee deep and knee deep is not enough you go to waist deep and waist deep is not enough eventually you go to a place where you're swimming in a totally immersed that means I'm going all in I may start ankle deep but I'm not going to end up there. I'm just going to go all in for God, swimming and, you know, completely immersed in the things of God, my destiny, my calling, my purposes. And that really, you know, uh, puts you on the you know, forefront of all that God would do. So I would challenge anybody listening to this, go all in. Don't be half-hearted. Amen. Well, we definitely appreciate your time, Pastor Raj. Uh, before we close it out, is there anything, any stories, anything you'd like to share before we close out? Well, um, I would probably share something recently because um, every one of us have to understand that we fight a real demonic situation. The enemy is real. You know, in and everything that we've spoken to, uh, these things will not be left unchallenged. The demonic will challenge every decision we make. He watches, he watches, he comes. And just recently in the last couple of years, I remember there was a, there was a time in my life, my wife and I, <clears throat> 2019, I remember, uh, we just got back from Prescott Conference back home. And my youngest daughter, uh, the day we landed back home, she complained of some pain in her mouth and she was bleeding and I thought she probably you know just she's just having some you know infection whatever 
and then we took her to the hospital only to find out that uh, you know she was dying she had a very rare um, <clears throat> kind of a situation the doctors were not knowing what to do her platelets her blood platelets were going down an average human beings probably having a hundred and fifty thousand platelets blood platelets but then when we took her to the hospital she had five thousand and that is dangerous anytime it goes below 20,000 is really very difficult she was she was probably in the tail end and we were really shocked with what was happening obviously she got admitted in the hospital and things like that and our whole life was spinning in front of us coming just back from conference you know just being ministered in conference getting excited to come and do all that God would do and we get hit with this situation it is many times why I mention this is anybody can serve God when you're on the mountaintop the true character of our relationship with God is tested in the valleys so that was a valley moment for me and my wife but we held on we believed God doctors gave no hope to my daughter they said that she's not gonna make it but I remember you know um, claiming every promise that's when every of my prayers every Bible reading Every sermon I've heard came alive to me because I started claiming and praying and contending with God and asking God that you touch my daughter. The doctors had no hope because they couldn't find out what was really happening. And uh, But God moved supernaturally. I remember God came through and you know her platelets begin to come up supernaturally. It was the doctors could not believe it. And within the next two days she was out of the ICU. She was back home. That's how quick God did the recovery. Amen. And uh, we still shout the victory. And um, we till date we have no clue what really happened to her. Doctors have really not been able to diagnose what really happened. But uh, I knew it was an assault. But I know how God turned it all around for good. But that situation was was very critical for us because I, I saw God come through for me but it's in those difficult seasons is when we really learn how to pray and all that we've learned you know you put to use there and the testimonies of Pastor Campbell and all these others they went through difficult situations and how they processed it and you hear those things but you really don't understand that one day you could go through the same that's a whole different ball game that's a different ball game yeah. that you begin to not just read about them now you gotta live what they lived and that really helped me so this is something that will happen you know, it make no mistake, somewhere our faith and all of this will be challenged, but we need to be able to overcome and we need to be able to come out on the other side. So that's what really helped us. So I shout the victory now. My daughter is doing fantastically well now, my wife and I, but God came through for us. So that will be challenged. And every listener, your faith will be challenged, your calling, everything will be challenged by the demonic, but Let's never forget that greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. He's going to help us. Amen. Well, Pastor Raj, we covered a lot, and we appreciate you for sharing your testimony and all the encouragement. And uh, for everybody listening, we'll see you guys next time.